Douglas Lundum from Uppsala University. And uh, the topic, as you see, is the emergence of anions from polarons and angulons. So please, Douglas, you can start. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for this uh, very nice uh, event that we can get to, to meet <laughs> in some way, uh, as, as far as we can in the present situation. And uh, so uh, I will try to explain essentially the, the title uh, of my talk, uh, which concerns uh, three types of, of particles. So it's, it ends on ons, which means that there's a certain particle here. So uh, they are all uh, quasi particles or sort of effective particles <clears throat> that arise in the, in the uh, interaction between uh, sort of subsystems of a, of a system, a quantum system. So uh, there will be the main topic is anions. And uh, I will uh, begin with, uh, since there will be uh, other talks in this conference also on anions, uh, I thought it would be suitable that I give a mini intro to uh, anions. And then we will discuss how these may emerge in uh, systems involving two other types of quasi-particles, namely polarons, and the angulons. Um, and yeah, so th this is really a two dimensional topic in this talk. And uh, maybe it's, so, so I have listed some references here and uh, it's maybe more physics uh, kind of talk, but the mathematics will be in the, the topology and also algebra involved. But on the analysis side, um, you should think a little bit more as a physicist uh, at this stage. Uh, so the references are concerned this uh, emergence uh, of um, anions. And I included the first reference, there's uh, uh, a paper with Nicolas Rougerie, who is also in the conference um, from 2016. That will be a, a slightly different uh, story or the, so we we uh, think about uh, a quantum hole setting or fraction quantum hole effect setting where you have a strong magnetic field so um, so uh, and, and in these two other papers that is the, the main focus here um, which is joint work with the uh, Jakob Oilo, Gasarian, Rougeri, Lemeshko and Seiringer and uh, the second one uh, is uh, with Brooks uh, and uh, Lemeshko and Jacobo. And uh, this uh, is really the first, uh, the, the one with the more authors is concerns the polarons and the, the second one with them concerns the angulons. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me give you an outline of, of uh, the talk. Uh, so I will give a, you a very brief introduction to uh, quantum statistics and the difference in, in three and two dimensions. You can also talk about one dimension, but we will not focus on this here. Uh, and then I will introduce a, a model with which we can illustrate very clearly how uh, you can sort of transmute, we use this word, transmutation of statistics from normal particles, normal uh, cases of bosons and fermions, which we see in three dimensions, but into these other forms of statistics that exist in two dimensions. So we can see this very, very clearly. And then uh, we talk about these uh, applications in terms of uh, polarons, which you think you can think of in, in our model or in, in our setting, these would be a planar, this would be a sort of planar situation or maybe some thin layer, maybe graphene or something where these particles can propagate. And then uh, there's also this angulon case, which is concerns more the rotation of a system. And what we're interested in here is somehow try to confine particles on a, on a sphere. But if you, if you want, you can just think of um, uh, the rotation of a molecule, which, uh, you know, so the, the, the rotation, uh, or the orientation would be essentially a position on the sphere. So um, yeah, so we will get back to this. Uh, so if we recall uh, quantum statistics in three dimensions, we have this dichotomy between bosons and fermions. And here 
it's illustrated in terms of the Pauli principle, which is valid for the fermions. So that the, if you cool the system uh, in the bosonic case, everybody drops to the ground state. And so the, in, in some kind of one body setting, while uh, in the fermionic case, they would have to fill up uh, the Fermi C. So we are of course uh, familiar with these types of um, a very different types of particles with uh, examples being photons being bosons and electrons being fermions and these electrons uh, satisfying the Pauli principle and forming you know sort of a matter in, which is um, has some uh, extensivity um, as as you fill that you know you, you you make more and more particles the system grows in size, while in the bosonic case, because of the lack of the Pauli principle, there's sort of more degenerate or fluffy <laughs> scenario where everybody can be in the same uh, in the same state in a sort of greater amplitude. Okay, so 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 the uh, the mathematical origin of these dichotomies, if we if we consider this um, uh, a, a state or some um, a wave function describing the positions of these particles. So then you could think of describing them. So say I'm now in three dimensions and I have n particles and I co consider uh, a complex valued wave function. Then the, uh, the, uh, the function values are themselves are not observable, but what is observable is if we take the absolute uh, value and take the square of that, that's a probability distribution. So this thing is, is an observable. We can, we can measure how the particles are distributed in space. Uh, but this observable has a symmetry. And namely, if we permute the indices, so if we're sort of acting on this thing by permutations, I'm not sure I had a name for them, maybe sigma. And then um, uh, I permute these indices. Then, of course, the uh, this probability distribution should not depend on that. So that's in this sense they are identical particles. However, if I if I then look at the so I have this symmetry in the uh, in the um, in in the modulus of the function, but I don't have the symmetry on the uh, actual face. However, if I'm taking this perspective where I can just uh, Act if I if I have these coordinates with these uh, labels and I act with permutations. Of course, if I if I make a simple um, transposition twice, then uh, I should get the identity. So so with that constraint, I say okay. When I do it once, I get something has to have the same mag uh, the same modulus, but it could have a different face. But if I do it again, I should get the same face. So if I get the fa same face, say z z is in u one. And and I get the constraint. This should be a z. So if I if I get the constraint z squared is equal to one, well then we have these two cases, either plus one or minus one, which would be the bosons respectively fermions. So so we see that it sort of arises from a um, representation of the exchange symmetry, here the permutations of n uh, labels, into u one the phases. In, in this in this problem where we're looking at complex valued functions, uh, so of course bosons would be uh, associated to um, to uh, Bose-Einstein statistics, and it, it it's the trivial representation, and fermions would be uh, associated to Fermi direct statistics, and it would be the sign representation of this thing, and of course what we do then in the end is to we separate our Hilbert space into two different types, one would be a symmetric square integral functions, and the other would be anti-symmetric square integral functions. Uh, in, in two dimensions, so there, people discovered already in, uh, you know, in the 60s and the 70s and 80s that, that there was some logical inconsistency in the previous <laughs> argument. Namely, you should not really think about labels. You have to sort of make sense of uh, what is an actual uh, configuration. I don't have time to go into the details here, but but essentially uh, it was uh, elaborated on by Lenos and Mirheim, uh, seventy-seven, and also independently by Golden, Menikoff, and Sharp from a sort of a diffeomorphism kind of perspective, and also by Wilczek um, a little bit later, 
who model these kinds of statistics in terms of attachment of magnetic flux to particles. So we will see how this comes about. But why should we be interested in 2D? Well, I've essentially already given you some, uh, some reasons. We can confine particles to, um, to a plane. And um, for instance, or some planar situation, and then in the in the interaction between the systems, you can have these quasi particles or some effective particles. So here, this is to illustrate what can happen. So essentially, the, there's um, instead of looking at uh, exchanges or the permutation group, what is the the correct exchange group to consider in this scenario is the braid group. So you can think of the space time paths of the particles going up here. There, these are two examples. So the particles are moving around in the plane. These are two examples. And uh, the, uh, the left one here is just one particle moving around a bunch of other particles, say they are p in number. And the other example, they are exchanging two of them, but there could be some other particles inside. And then you draw a corresponding space time diagram, and then you translate that into a phase. So what you do is to sort of look at each time you have a crossing in this diagram, that would be a simple exchange. So that is associated to a fixed phase. So I drew here, the, this unit circle here is um, that phase, essentially the simple phase you can get. So in this case, you have the full unit circle. Uh, the special case would be alpha equals zero here. So alpha here is the, is, is, called the statistics parameter. So, so alpha equals zero would be bosons and alpha equals one uh, would be fermions. And um, so that would be boson, this would be fermion, but you can have anything in between and that's why they call anions by, by weak check. So uh, yeah, so you can compute the corresponding um, phase that you should get when you have, a, when you have a, this symmetry. So it's somehow in the system. So again, it's for identical particles um, that we have this, this, um, this possibility and uh, with the braid group. But the interesting thing is that also when, when particles don't just exchange, but when they actually move around each other, there has to be a face uh, popping up, except in the Bos boson or fermion case. So, um, so, so, and, and actually one way to model this, which we shall discuss next is how you model this. But uh, one simple way is to sort of attach flux. And then when these particles move around, they will pick up faces uh, when they um, encircle the flux, these fluxes. So, and if the flux is tightly uh, localized around the particle, you can think of sort of the Arnold bohm scenario that we already heard uh, a little bit about. So here, I will not discuss this picture. This was essentially the experiment that, um, that Jakob talked about this morning the, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, where, okay, so you, it's planar system. You can play with certain parameters. The main parameter is perhaps the magnetic field, like an external magnetic field, which is approximately constant. So you play with that and, and, uh, and you see things happening as you play with the magnetic field. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so this, the discovery was that for certain uh, fractions uh, of, of, of certain uh, natural uh, constants, you see in this magnetic field, you see certain uh, features. And this was, so in the beginning, you saw that integer multiples, so you would have the integer quantum Hall effect. Then you would see that at certain fractions, but typically they had an old numerate or say old denominator um, and um, and they would they would be these fractional quantum hold states and um, the um, picture would be that you would have anions emerging in this kind of system but the details there this is something that which is you know something we're trying to investigate here and uh, the right picture is that there, there are also some fractions where you have uh, even and the number there, and there, and there you, you might get something more complicated. And that picture, this is the next uh, sort of example application. Why people are very interested in these any or one reason why people are very interested in these anions is if you if you uh, generalize things a little bit. So instead of considering 
complex valued, but you consider, say, vector valued functions with d in, say, in d dimensions, uh, then you can have um, higher dimensional representations of the braid group. And these will be, these may be termed non abelian anions. And the hope is to use this for some kind of quantum computation. So, so here is an example you, when some particles move around the, each other in a funny way, you can generate, in this case, minus the unit matrix. <laughs> so, um, but I will not uh, have time to talk about this here. Uh, so we will focus on the on the what is known as the abelian case. So the abelian case is um, you can really think of as a topological um, um, possibility, namely just th these are essentially the the different um, the different bundles that you can get somehow. If you look at the, uh, you know, there's a certain local symmetry. So the, these uh, magnetic fields are associated to the curvature of a, of a, of, of a U1 bundle, essentially. So let's start from the beginning. So we have a, a classical Hamiltonian. So, and we, whether we have these N particles, say on R2. And each one has a position, xj, and, ha and, and a momentum, pj. So we, we start out with, the, with just the kinetic energy plus possibly some external potential. And uh, this, um, and so here we just put the, you know, the one over, you could have a maybe one over 2m for your mass also here. Um, but let's, let's put that to one here for simplicity. And then when we quantize this, so if we uh, represent this um, uh, this momentum by the minus i times the gradient, also I put h bar to one, if, in case you worry about that. And um, and then um, um, our corresponding quantum Hamiltonian would be the the usual uh, Schrodinger operator. And, with the sort of minus Laplacian acting on the on a, on the wave function, and then we have this possible uh, external potential. So I'm I'm considering here either bosons or fermions. So we have the, the flexibility, and uh, so this Hilbert space would be either the symmetric or the anti-symmetric functions. We could also think of re restricting this Hilbert space a little bit more. So we have actually uh, maybe some suitable subspace. <laughs> Um, of, of this Hilbert space. Uh, so this would be what I call free bosons of fermions in the sense that they're, they don't have an external magnetic field and they are non-interacting. But, but I, could, I, I would like them to be trapped somehow. You know, it, it, this could just be some Dirichlet boundary conditions or something, but, but typically we would have to have some kind of a one body trap for them. But then we have the magnetic scenario where we're adding to this, uh, this gradient, we're adding a, a connection or a, um, in this case, then uh, say, it, yeah, so it would be a, a, a vector valued function here. And in the general scenario, this would be something complex valued, but um, th essentially the, this would be where th this bundle goes from something trivial into something curved, depending on this this uh, connection here. So, um, so, so, so anions would be associated to a certain flat or locally flat such connection. So, so here I define free anions with this statistics parameter alpha that we talked about. Uh, so this Hamiltonian here, so again, if I, the notation is I have just H zero, this the, the, the Hamiltonian, but with an A upstairs, that's I'm adding uh, this vector potential here. So in the anyone case, I'm adding a particular vector potential. So, and I multiply, it's a real thing, but I multiply it by I, so it's purely imaginary. And then alpha is there, uh, but this, this vector potential is, is uh, of the following type. So it's really that, okay, so maybe you can understand it first by just looking at what the corresponding mag magnetic field is. So if you take the curl of this, then it's really just the sum of delta uh, 
functions and and so it's supported really on on the diagonal so i wrote the diagonal here is this delta uh, so that's where uh, the many body diagonal where the any two particles meet yeah. so uh, so so this potential would be singular there but outside it has the property that the magnetic field is zero so in that sense it's it's locally flat and you can write it in terms of uh, this this notation is you, you uh, the perp would be to sort of you take a vector in 2d and you and you rotate it uh, by 90 degrees here if i minus perp i also divide by the the length of it squared and so if we do that with all so so the jth particle sees k the k other or the, the other particles enumerated by k in terms of this thing but but a nice way to write that is also if you, if you if you introduce this um, the product of all the z j so if you if you represent each particle position by a complex number z and then you take the difference and you take this product so there will be sort of a, this fundamental determinant and this thing which is an anti-symmetric thing if you if you take that and divide it by its uh, absolute value this is really like a a phase shift that's something which which changes the the phase as particles exchange but it's it's sort of it's unitary so if you if you um, if you if you then take the cos so you can view this as a sort of a singular gauge transformation so this a would be the singular gauge transformation which takes you from a bosonic to a fermionic bond so it takes you from from alpha equals to 0 to alpha equals to 1 but then if you put in this alpha here, you can sort of play with the, with how, you know, how you go. So if alpha is two, then you sort of back to bosons in some sense, but uh, perhaps uh, modeled in a different way. Okay, so, and, and a useful notation is also that if we, um, if that we can regularize this Hamiltonian. So this thing has a certain singularity because if you square this, you would have an A squared and the A squared is quite singular. So for, for a computational, or sort of say if you want to do numerical estimations of the spectrum, it's very useful to, um, uh, to, to regularize this. And, and this can be done by actually multiplying from the right and the left, or you know, taking a similarity transformation of this operator uh, with, with the help of just the modulus of this thing to the a suitable power alpha. And if you want, you can also write this in the same way that this is a, a vector potential, but it, it has then an, another component which is actually real and is, is orthogonal to that, to that uh, first component. So it has a, a peculiar um, symmetry. Okay, so now the main result of, of our works uh, here is to, um, to sort of give you a, a, a different description of this or, or, or a way how such a model can emerge. So, uh, so we have an uh, emergence of anions via a statistics transmutation, which I will talk about now. There's a, uh, in, in the process, we see that we get a coherent state of uh, composite bosons of fermions. And so a composite boson, so I wrote down here, this is, okay, it's the regularized Hamiltonian, but with 2n, so alpha is 2n, and n is an integer. So it's really a copy of the bosonic case. And then you have this uh, uh, A here, this, this uh, gauge field here. So, but if you want, you can think of this as, as sort of uh, sandwiching your original Hamiltonian uh, inside this Z to, a, to, to power 2n. So you can actually interpret this as a, as, um, as a composite boson in the sense that this is a boson, but together with a flux, there's a flux attached to it. So, so, so there will be a certain formula emerging like, like this uh, for the anion Hamiltonian that you can actually write it as a, essentially like a Poisson distribution of uh, composite boson Hamiltonians. And you can e even simplify it even more. So this is the, uh, so if you, if you, uh, 
if you uh, multiply these things uh, on the right and the left, you, on, on the left hand side here, you would get this, this object. And then uh, you can view that as actually an interpolation between the, the bosonic, if it was, or you, if fermionic, if you want it as a, as a reference, but say the alpha equals zero case and the alpha equals two case. So you see, if you put the alpha equals two here, you would get exactly that. So it, it's in some sense, uh, it's a little bit uh, maybe deceptive because it, it looks like a linear interpolation, but they, because of these factors in this similarity transformation there, it's not necessarily like a nice linear, um, or actually be, yeah, also because of the, these are not commuting operators. So there will be not be a, a nice linear interpolation in the spectrum. It's more complicated than that. Okay, so here is this model that um, that I want to um, to discuss. So um, so 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 let's start with this uh, Hamiltonian H zero here, but we add a, a collective degree of freedom. So I will just describe what I mean. But let's consider just um, uh, like a ladder operator. Some you can think of some bosonic degree of freedom here. So we have a, a, a creation and annihilation operator A and A dagger, and we can form a corresponding number, uh, number operator. And we, we have, a, say, a, a basis uh, of eigenstates to this number operator. So, so, so then I take this original Hamiltonian and I add to it uh, omega. So I introduce a parameter omega here, uh, some positive number. And I have the number operator. Okay, so that's just sort of the energy level in this in this somehow ladder uh, that we have formed. But then uh, we have also gamma, another parameter, a real number times omega. And then we we take uh, a product of a, a function f and a dagger, and then we have f inverse and a. Uh, and then you add just a constant, just for. Uh, for sort of aesthetic reasons to, to, um, to balance things out. So this is just a constant, which depends on the omega and gamma. So, and, and uh, okay, so what you should note is that omega, so, so we have this omega, but the, um, the, uh, the ratio between this parameter and that parameter is exactly gamma. So we can consider two different uh, scenarios or choices for this f which are of the use. And one is to, to take exactly this, this uh, thing that I had here, uh, or that thing squared, say. So that would be exactly attaching two flux units to each particle. So sort of going boson to boson. And okay, so, so each time you multiply with the F, you attach two fluxes. The other F, which is useful to consider is to not only use the, the phase, but also, uh, you know, it's more, it's a vortex instead of a flux. And because you also have sort of a, a, a dependence on the, the modulus here. So you, you really are um, multiplying the function by, in this case, it would be really the product of uh, zi minus zj squared. So, so in, in, uh, in Jacob's um, uh, notation, or, or uh, this would be essentially attaching a Laughlin type of factor to the, to the, uh, to the state. So, okay, so what I'm considering here is like this operator. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Darius. Just a very stupid question, but why cannot you attach a single flux to a, to a- I'm not allowing that here. <laughs> okay, but in principle, you can think of it, or it's just there is some uh, physics, uh, I don't know, motivation why that's that that's not meaningful. You can you can think of this, and of course you can say, um, you know, you can we can take functions which are of that type, um, but here I want to do it sort of in a fully symmetric way. Uh, so okay. you can just say that okay. Let me just divide up the space into sort of sectors, and each sector. So I will have I have this picture here. So so each sector here is that of um, has this this 
big factor, like Laughlin factor attached to it. So, so within H0, you could have different angular momentums and so on. But I, but I want to sort of think of this as separating so that if I attach this full chunk of angular momentum, <laughs> which is it's large because it's uh, like n squared, um, that would be like jumping up to a higher level in this in this diagram here. So, so the zero thing would it would be you know like low angular momentum, possibly you know, and then uh, you know you have a confinement of the system somehow, and um, and uh, the sort of the original problem. But then as I step up, so so th this this combination, if I act with it on this state, I would make a jump up in this ladder and I can jump again and again. And sort of the, the probability to make a jump would be um, given by this amplitude here. Um, but there's also this sort of omega in here that tells us that there's a, an energy gap between these parallel uh, scenarios here that there is essentially this omega which um, tells you that there's a cost of energy to go up or you can think of it as this, there's a, an associated cost and energy to create all these vortices or uh, fluxes on, uh, on each particle. Okay, and so, and then of course I can jump down also. So if I apply the other thing, I jump down in this ladder here, uh, but this continues. <clears throat> okay, so, and you see that these are really e even integer, um, uh, spaces or, or, or systems and uh, flux attached to each part. So, that, so this is really a ladder of composite bosons or fermions if you started with fermions. And if you started with fermions, then the Laughlin state would be exactly here. And this would be sort of another type of, or well, the, the sort of the, the simplest Laughlin state here, and then you would get the other things here. Okay, but then the, the, the trick is that we can, Let's look at this, this model and take the limit where we take this gap, somehow this omega uh, to infinity. So, the, so we can think of this as some kind of adiabatic limit where we sort of separate, we're making this gap uh, fully present there and we're separating things. But we do it in a way that, okay, both these terms are getting, so both the, this gap energy and the hopping amplitude and, and we keep the ratio fixed, that's the gamma. Then the claim is that we get exactly anions in the bottom of the spectrum. And, uh, and the statistics parameter is given by this gamma. So it's actually two times gamma squared. And then, but in the higher levels, uh, you would get an integer multiple again. So the picture is um, you have this, and then when we make this, tra this transmutation, when we, when we take this limit, uh, with omega going to infinity, <clears throat> we get this other version of um, this ladder. And uh, of course we would still have these, um, this, this uh, possibility to jump up and down here, but it, it's, you know, the gap is quite high, but the lowest energy, you know, that, you know so that we have this, this sort of lowest reference state, the reference state becomes different. <laughs> And, it, and you, you can think of it as there's an influence of all of the different, uh, you know, all of, everything in this bundle here has made an influence on this, this sort of emergent state. And, and what sort of uh, technically what is happening is that you actually get a coherent state of in this ladder. So let's look at the in practically what, what's going on here. I have to maybe speed up a little bit, but, but um, so the, 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 it's really an algebraic operation here. And, the, and we can think of, um, we want to diagonalize this, this uh, operator H omega there. And, uh, and you know, there's a canonical way to do that. <clears throat> One is to apply a similarity transformation. Well, it depends on F. So if we took this, the first case of F, then it's actually a unitary thing. If you take the second case, it's not unitary, but we can, you can still sort of work with this thing. You can change, uh, say you can look in weighted Hilbert spaces and so on and, and so on, but, but it's, it's a useful thing to look at, even though it's not uh, no longer unitary or you know, self-adjoint Hamiltonian. 
but you can still it's, it would be similar to us to, to one and uh, and from a computational perspective this is actually very useful you can compute the free anion spectrum using that uh, that model so so we take here this f and you raise it to the power n so you can write that in terms of an exponential but then you have this uh, another transformation which is a shift transformation which depends on gamma and uh, so it's just this combination of um, of gamma and, and the a's and this is a this would be a unitary <clears throat> operator so then we just use our our uh, favorite formula for um, for uh, the, the commutator of operator you know how, how operators commute so we can expand them um, this uh, uh, this process in terms of commutators and each commutator with these these pieces here are simple to compute. So, so if, perhaps I can I can just tell you the result that if I if I'm uh, if I'm applying this this uh, similarity on a, I will get f times a, and if I apply a dagger, I get f inverse on a dagger. So that's nice because then uh, my a dagger gets an f inverse and my a gets an f, so they cancel there. Uh, the u or the u applied to a that shifts the a. With the constant, so that's the why it's called a shift operator. And a dagger is also shifted with the same constant. So if we apply this now, so h prime here is defined as as this taking these transformations on h, both s and u. So then let me keep. So this is the h zero, the original operator, also transmuted or or, or um, with these op these things applied. But the rest simplifies so that's the whole point so so everything here uh, sort of cancels up or becomes just omega times the number operator so that's nice that's why it's sort of the in this picture there will still be a, a fixed sort of energy associated to each uh, level here so you still have this omega uh, with these different levels however the h zero transforms so you would have h zero prime on each uh, level here instead. Um, so let's look at that. And, and in that operator, there would be these derivatives. So that's where the sort of the magic happens is that um, you have, a, you take derivatives of this log. And so, so, so that's when we, when we make this S transformation on the derivatives, on the gradients, you would get actually the gradient plus this F, which would be somehow an emergent gauge field, but the strength of it depends on n. So it depends on where we are on this ladder. So if I just look at the, the Laplacian, uh, so that would be just the square of these of these uh, transformed gradients, then I would get, you know, there would be some combinations here. So there, there's one, this is the original Laplacian, but then there will be these, these gauge terms coming in. And they would depend on where I am uh, with the, in this combination. There would be u inverse and u, um, giving us a contribution to the strength. But then there will be also f squared and then an n squared term here. So um, yeah, so so the if I sum it up, the transformed Hamiltonian is just this sort of la transformed Laplacian, which amounts to adding a gauge field. And then this extra energy. So, so one way to understand what happens, especially in the in the lowest sector here. So if we look at what happens in the lowest sector, we would just apply this zero, the zero state uh, in the ladder, but there will be also this u's here. So and this u on the zero state, this is exactly a coherent state. So you apply this shift on the on the vacuum, you get the a certain uh, combination of, of uh, excited states here. And uh, so you can compute the expected uh, number of particles in that state, and that would be exactly gamma squared. And you can also look at sort of the variance in this thing. There would be uh, the, that n plus n squared. Okay, so I have this formula. Uh, also in the higher states, there's this nice formula for what the H, what the transformed or transmuted Hamiltonian is. It is exactly the original one in uh, an effective gauge field, but the strength depends on the gamma and n. And then I get this other term, which 
So that could be an, an interaction term actually, uh, depending on what F is, is chosen to be, but the strength also depends on this. And then we have this. There will of course also be some cost terms here, but uh, let, let's ignore that for now so you can continue. So, so I, I, I claim that we get these two, two scenarios in one with one choice, which was this, this phase factor, we get actually anions, exactly this anionic A, with the F square being an interaction potential. So it's um, interacting anions. And the second case <clears throat> was when we took the Z, and then we actually get free and regularized anions at the same, you know, you get that for free. Uh, because this F in that case, there's a magic cancellation between uh, between the the gradient of this thing and the gradient of that thing um, to, to be zero. So, that, so actually the interaction drops out. So, so then you, you can use this, this machinery to compute also numerically the spectrum of free versus interacting animals. Um, so I see the, the time flying here. But then, um, so on the left, we have this free case in quotation mark and and in the right we have the interacting case and, and alpha is, is is on this axis and so this would be uh, f is, is z over mod z squared and here f is no sorry reversed uh, z squared and here z okay so yeah so i wanted to be clear on how this process of transmutation happens. Yeah. But, but now we can uh, apply this uh, in different scenarios. So one scenario is, is uh, what is known as polarons. So this means that we have um, an interaction between um, some, you know, there are two types of particles in the system in some, in some sense, or you can have a family of the other, but say you have a, what you can call impurities or there's so sort of, say electrons. And these electrons are moving around in a in a in some kind of lattice um, system, but this lattice system can have vibrations when these electrons move around. They would change. They would they would be a sort of um, they would they move a little bit because of the uh, because of the attraction uh, versus repulsion repulsion uh, with these uh, charges. So then there could be these phonons in this material. So, so what, and one model for this is known as the Frölich polaron, where you consider uh, a, a certain type of interaction between the electrons or between these or impurities, if you want, and this somehow bath of uh, phonons which can emerge here. Uh, and 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 indeed, you, you would see that there would be a, like um, an effective state forms between this this impurity and the bath in the and this bath, and this is known as a polaron. And and this is exactly of the type of this uh, of a coherent state. Uh, and and we can look at a at um, at a scenario where we can where we can get something like this. So what we consider here is to add a magnetic field and the rotation and have them sort of uh, cancel out or you know you, if you choose them suitably you can still think of this as being um, like the free uh, you know you can get a cancellation at, at least on the on the um, uh, momenta of the electrons or these impurities but there might be a different there might be some some interact, you know, some potential here. Then you would have some um, some uh, energies and or dispersion relation for these phonons, and there will be some interactions uh, between them. And so you can look at a simple case of um, two particles in relative coordinates. I will ha not have time to talk about this, but uh, you can you can you can see more concretely what happens. With a suitable interaction, um, and you can find that the, indeed you get an emergent gauge field with a, a certain um, strength, which actually is is uh, it it would be dependent on the separation of the particles. It could depend on 
uh, on this uh, radial sort of the distance between particles. However, we, if, if the interaction is suita suitably chosen, you can get it to be approximately constant. And this would depend on the total sort of angular momentum in the system, the omega. So, and then the, if I have one minute to say something about the angulons, so that it's a similar scenario, but you, you consider, in, say, instead of free particles moving in the plane, we consider the orientation of a linear molecule. So here these are the molecules. And, um, and, and think of their orientation that they, they, you know, they have some rotation energy. And this rotation energy is given by just the, um, the uh, angular momentum here. And, and you can, if you, depending on how you represent this angular momenta, you can think of this as just being the, the uh, Laplacian on the sphere, actually. Um, so, 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 so in this, in this way, if you have um, <clears throat> molecules interacting with some bath of uh, particles, uh, you can, you can have a similar scenario somehow, the, the interaction between uh, um, the uh, energy or the energy uh, momentum on a sphere in this case, uh, and uh, with the bath. And uh, yeah, so one outcome of this is that you can compute, well, if you apply the same machinery, you can compute also the spectrum of two anions on the sphere. <clears throat> However, there's a technical detail there, which maybe I should just stop here and then see if there's any questions. So, so yes, the conclusion is um, somehow if you want the moral of the story, which I would say is just quantum mechanics essentially, so if you don't know with certainty which collective state that your um, system is in, then, so here we're thinking of these different um, composite boson states. But let's just consider uh, superpositions of all possibilities. So we have this chain of different um, composite bosons. And then we, we consider coherent states uh, of such uh, superpositions. So, so here we have this coherent state, which involves all these different possibilities. And why coherent state? You can think of, you want to, you know, if, if it's somehow, a, a, if you're approaching a classical scenario, you have sort of a maximal amount of information about the system. Or um, in some sense, if, if you reverse this, you have a minimal uncertainty in, this, in, the, in, the, in the system. And this is here represented by this coherent state. That is sort of there is a minimal uncertainty there, uh, and you saw you see that this distribution is 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 correlated with uh, another collective degree of freedom. So in our case, this was a say the total angular momentum, and then you you can sort of describe the system in terms of that, and and the result may have a useful alternative representation. So in our case, this was anions. Okay, thank you. Uh, these are some references, and uh, here's a runestone in Uppsala. Thank you very much, I guess. So thank you. So are there questions, comments, remarks? Jacob, so Jacob, yeah. you want to ask one? Yes, yes well, uh, so thank you, Douglas. This was very interesting. And uh, you. unfortunately, you, you had to be very quick at the end. Uh, yes. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, well, as I understood, you had this somehow this uh, general uh, formalism of coupling to uh, this uh, harmonic oscillator, which in, in the end in these applications, there were of course many because you had uh, different modes. But um, um, so that is sort of say the common trait uh, behind this, uh, but the specifics of, uh, <clears throat> of the Polaron model, uh, so does that uh, come here in somehow uh, the- uh, Yes, so, um, so, so you would be interested in how is exactly this coupling here. Yeah. You, so exactly. that depends mm -hmm. on the interaction choice. Mm -hmm. So indeed, depend, so if you would have like a, a, the 3D Coulomb, or, or if you would have, a, if mm -hmm. the polarization field is, so let's see if I say it's correct now, but I think it's like, if it's like a one over R squared, which would be sort of the effective, um, polarization field in, in 3D, then uh, you would not uh, 
then then you would not get a local uh, or like a constant statistics parameter then it depends on r but if wow. if you, but if you're indeed in in 2d so if the mm -hmm. if the interaction is is so so you can think of a certain two dimensional Frelich polaron mm -hmm. where because it it's essentially has to do with a, a logarith like a log kind of interaction between the the charges and and the polarization field would be sort of like a one over r then uh, you indeed get a constant uh, uh, alpha here mm -hmm. so 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 indeed in this model it's more correct uh, that you you think of this there's a effective gauge field but this gauge field may depend so the strength of it mm -hmm. so what we see we get the, the correct form of it mm -hmm. it sort of has this uh, it's 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 going it's circling around the uh, center of mass of the particles mm -hmm. but uh, it may depend in a different way with the the distance but if you have a suitable interaction so it, it so if you really yeah. stick to 2d <laughs> Two then you get so the so correct uh, interaction. So logarithmic, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then exactly. So if it's and then and indeed there are certain experiments where they can see this somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not an expert on, the, on this, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. So so it is um, realistic from that perspective to consider such real such uh, interactions, and then you can compute this this uh, alpha. Uh, as a function of r, and you see that it actually is a constant, mm -hmm. and this constant is is uh, set by the uh, whatever the macroscopic <laughs> constant is in the system. So that would be typically this omega, or you know, the the, the B field, or you know, this um, the, how much it, because it, mm -hmm. it, for, to get anions, I should stress that it's a good uh, point that you need to break the symmetry somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, uh, so one way is to rotate the system or add a magnetic field or something like this, because you have to go somehow away from, from zero and either to positive or negative alphas, if you want. Um, and the direction you go is determ determined by, by breaking the symmetry in some mm -hmm. direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, there is another one. So that one? Yes, go ahead, Ayman. So you, you want to ask one? Yes, uh, a technical question, uh, Douglas. So I see that you introduce uh, some kind of uh, a linear combination of the Arunov boom uh, potentials you know, with singularity. So just thinking about that, is it some kind of a perforated domain? You assume that your 2D domain is, uh, is perforated with the holes, I mean? So that's usually mm -hmm. what the Arunov boom potentials in, in other contexts. Okay, no, so, so the thing is that these Arunov boom potentials are really attached to the particles. So, so I'm not considering uh, any um, external flux. Yeah. So, or, or you know that. So, so the domain is you can think of being in a in a some subset of the plane, or you know the whole plane with a harmonic oscillator confinement, and um, yeah, and 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 I'm not uh, make, I'm not adding any other flux except for this attachment of flux to the particles. So that means that the let's see the that this. Um, the magnetic field is, is really zero except on the particles themselves. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, okay. so that, no, in this in this problem, and you can consider other problems, but in this in this model, we don't have any external Arnold Bohm fluxes. Okay. But okay. probably it, it could be a good idea to include like an external constant magnetic field and see. And see what happens. Okay, thank you. Reasons. So any other question? I do have just one, uh, so maybe uh, less mine. So, uh, well, it's the same question as before. So, 
Um, so I guess, so you get just uh, even alphas because you consider two particles, is that uh, correct? So in the end, I mean, in the, in the polar on model. Uh, okay. Um, now in the polar on model, you can, you can transfer, um, so, but in the polar, so, there could be a difference in when we go up in particle number, but if you just have two particles mm -hmm. and you separate, so, so the thing is that you, you can first argue that you can separate out the center of mass. Yes. Uh, because it will sort of get, so what we're doing here is in, in some sense, you can also think of taking a, a large mass, like heavy electrons, so large mass. That mm -hmm. would be like, you know, putting in this omega here. So, um, so uh, yeah, and then, um, uh, and then you would only have this relative angular momentum left. So essentially, the only interaction that can happen between the particles would be, you know, to 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 uh, add uh, or subtract relative angular momentum. If you think of just in terms of, uh, um, okay, so you can have linear relative momentum, or you can have angular relative momentum. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, so, so that would give you um, this type of, uh, I don't know, the, the, there will be an attachment or you get the term of the type you want. So you, there is a, an attachment of... of um, yeah, but I'm wondering why it is even. So the, the two uh, gamma square, why do you get just the two in front? So that, that's the, what I'm... Uh, but I think it's out. again. Uh, um, because of the symmetry. In the original problem, I think. Um, okay, that's a good question, but, but I think you would see this in the. Essentially, when you pass to these coordinates, everything is symmetric with respect to. To um, if you so map, because yeah, so I think because you are considering map, a, two, a two body problem that point. So and you go, you you look at the relative coordinate. I think that's yeah, exactly. We're in relative coordinates and it's phi and and so just because of the setup, there will, there is permutation symmetry in this in the original problem. So there there will be this symmetry when you map phi to phi plus pi essentially. Uh, okay. So then because of that, I think you would have this even. Okay, so no further question, I think. So let me just check that here. Yeah, okay. So thank you again uh, for the nice thoughts. And uh, well, I think we can move to the next.